Orders of the day. Ballot item number 33, order M56, second reading of Bill 56, an act to proclaim Flooding Awareness Week and to promote public awareness of flooding issues. Ms. McMahon. I recognize the member from Beaches East York to move second reading of the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move second reading of Bill 56, an act to proclaim Flooding Awareness Week and to promote public awareness of flooding issues. Ms. McMahon has moved second reading of Bill 56, an act to proclaim Flooding Awareness Week and to promote public awareness of flooding issues. Pursuant to Standing Order 100, the member has 12 minutes for her presentation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be in the chamber at night. Um, I'm here. I'm excited and thrilled to speak to you about my private member's Bill 56, Fewer Floods, Safer Ontario Act. And essentially, this bill is about um, education, awareness, and prevention. And it does three things. And it creates a um, Flooding Awareness Week, the final week of March, which would be right now, this time next year, um, if passed. And it creates um, a stronger website, a uh, Government of Ontario website with more uh, education on basement flooding mitigation measures and overall flooding mitigation measures. And it sends out an infographic that has basement flooding mitigation measures um, to every Ontarian. And it can go out, my idea was for it to go out with the property tax bills, but it can go out anyway as long as it gets in the hands of Ontarians to keep them safe. And now I'd like to talk to you about the top 10 reasons why you should support my bill. A little David Letterman style without me throwing the cards. Number one, it can save your residents hardships financially, physically, and mentally. We are public servants. We are here to serve the public. We all got elected because we care about our communities and we want to help make their lives better. Helping our residents avoid hardship is what my bill would do when it's passed tonight. And so physically, think about that. You wake up and you see a flood in your basement. All your prized possessions are there. Your family mementos, your kids' artwork that you've saved, for nostalgic purposes over the years, your family photos, they're all floating in water or heaven forbid sewage. That could have been avoided had Private Members Bill 56 been passed. Number two, 10 percent of homes in Canada are no longer insurable relative to flood risk. Imagine that. That is scare a scary thought but it's actually reality. That is dangerous. Imagine driving your car without insurance. How do you sleep at night? That can be avoided. Number three, flooding is the number one cause of public emergency in Ontario. It's the number one natural disaster in Canada. It's costing more can Canadians more than any other climate issue. It, these facts cannot be ignored, and it's only getting worse in this climate emergency. There are fires and extreme heat, but flooding is the number one issue, and we can do something to help that, help mitigate that. Everyone knows someone whose basement has flooded. Heck, I've been speaking to almost every one of you, actually every one of you in this chamber I've spoken to face to face, and I've heard stories of your own basements flooding. And some of you have done the measures, putting in sump pumps, putting in backwater valves, cleaning out the eaves straws, disconnecting your downspouts, but some of you haven't, and your neighbors probably haven't. So we need to get that education out there. Number four, there's a high cost of inaction. We know that. With 1.2 billion total insured catastrophic losses in Ontario, 
in 2022. That flooding in BC a few years back, $9 billion price tag. Alberta, $5 billion. This government prides itself in being fiscally responsible, and quite frankly, so do I. We saw in the budget we can't afford these colossal price tags. We can do something to help mitigate that. Number five, the bill is inspired directly by the government's own flooding report, their flooding strategy from 2020, and builds off recommendations from reports from the Auditor General, from the Financial Accountability Officer, and from Intact Centre on Climate Adaptation from the University of Waterloo. Few members of that uh, department are here tonight and uh, very excited to see how this goes and when it's passed. <laughs> These are the experts. We like to think we're the sharpest knives in the drawer. I hate to break it to us, but we're not. We know many things, but when we commission reports, they are from experts who have the education, sometimes the lived experience, and the knowledge. And when I remember at City Hall, we commissioned so many reports and then they sat on, on the shelves collecting dust and cobwebs. Well, the time is now to take action and I'm happy to work together with you to action your own reports tonight. Number six, the weather of the past is no longer a good predictor of the weather of the present nor the future. Wherever it rains, it can flood. It's not that old style thinking of, I don't live next to a river or a stream or a big body of water, so I won't flood, my house won't flood. That is no longer the case. Anywhere it rains, it can flood. I actually called Mother Nature tonight to have that storm brought out to help with my private member's bill. We're in a climate crisis. Maybe some of you remember the story of Burlington in August 2014. 195 millimeters of rain fell in a six hour period. It's what's called a water bomb, but not a fun water bomb. 3,300 homes flooded, 80% were outside of the flood risk area. No one expected that. Least of all the mayor of Burlington, who found five and a half feet of water and sewage in his basement. His neighbor, his basement, bone dry. Why? Because his neighbor did these mitigation measures, many of them subsidized by their own municipality. And I know City of Toronto subsidizes many of these initiatives, so why not have residents learn about that to keep them safe? Number seven, for every dollar invested in climate adaptation, there is a savings of three to eight dollars in cost avoidance. Again, we want to be fiscally responsible. We want to be fiscally prudent. It's either pay now or pay later. And personally, I'd rather pay now for a sump pump, a Bach water valve, not even pay at all to clean out my eaves trough because I'll get my husband to do that. <laughs> but. <laughs> We need to be preventative and act that way and get the information out to residents. Number eight, 70% of people action two or more of the mitigation measures from the infographic within six months. It's been proven to work. We just need to get it in everyone's hot little hands. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend my Saturday night Googling how to clean up a basement flood. I want to know about that and take action ahead of time. Because I want to spend my Saturday nights watching the Leafs. Win. Lose. I mean win. I mean win. <laughs> so we need to get proactive and get the information out there. Easy to do. Number nine. Bill 56 is a win for everyone. It's not a partisan issue. It's a win for insurers. It's a win for renters living in the basements. I've lived in a basement and boy, I do not want to be swimming in sewage. 
It's a win for homeowners, it's a win for municipalities, and it's a win for government. There is no downside to this bill whatsoever. Number 10, the last one, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We are here to work together for the greater good. That's why our residents have sent us here. That's what Ontarians expect. They want us to collaborate. This is an easy bill to collaborate on. As I said, it's a win-win for everyone. We can have a kumbaya moment tonight. It's a great opportunity for all of us to work together, as we all want to do. We want to collaborate on this number one public emergency in Ontario. I want to do that with you tonight to keep Ontarians safe. And so I also want to thank, because there's no I in team, and I couldn't have done this private members bill without many people, and they're here tonight. And there's my marvelous team. Where are you? Fusive Ellen, Cool Kate, Marvelous Maisie, Magnificent Marietta, Notable Noor, where are you? <laughs> Somewhere. And the Intact Center for Climate Adaptation, Blair Feltmate, Catherine Backos, and Angela is with you. We have Conservation Ontario. We have uh, a Credit Valley Conservation Authority. We have the cooperators. Um, we have Passive House. Chris Ballard is very uh, excited about this. We, I've worked with many people on this. It is just not all MM. It is mostly other people and me. <laughs> Minister Blair, um, uh, in Minister of Emergency Preparedness. And actually tonight, the City of Toronto has a member's motion going to council asking for all council to support it. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that that will happen. And so you have people from all walks of life working together on this bill. And I'm looking forward to passing it with you this evening to keep Ontarians safe. Thank you. Further debate? I recognize the member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to speak to Bill 56, an act to proclaim Flooding Awareness Week and to promote public awareness of all that this government is doing regarding prevention and mitigation of flooding. I do want to thank the member from Beaches East York for bringing this bill forward, for providing more information leading to hopefully better preparation to all of our residents is certainly a laudable goal. Our government has taken a whole-of-government approach to be better prepared for flood risks and ultimately to protect the people of Ontario. If I may, Speaker, I would like to provide some history and some context around these issues. Many of our members may well be aware of these details, but it's also possible that many are not, and it's most likely that many of our residents, hopefully viewers of this legislature, are not as informed as they could be regarding the issues around flooding. I will start, Madam Speaker, with 1954 and the occurrence of Hurricane Hazel. I am, of course, speaking of the actual windstorm that swept across the Caribbean, the U.S., and came to Canada right here in Tor the Toronto area, and not of our late friend, uh, Mayor Hazel McCallion, who was nicknamed Hurricane Hazel. While our late friend was a force of nature that brought great things to the region, the storm was devastating, bringing extremely heavy rainfall on top of a wetter-than-average season already, which caused horrific flooding around the Don Valley. The storm killed 81 people here, right here in Toronto. And while there was already, at that time, there was already some work within municipal jurisdictions to be aware of flood-prone lands and some efforts to provide stormwater drainage, this hurricane triggered changes to the Conservation Authorities Act to enable, authorize, and prioritize conservation authorities to be the leading experts on flood zone and natural hazards and even to acquire lands to provide a buffer zone, holding area for areas for high water events, and to help prevent future building within areas that are prone to such damage. The decision was made to make the Conservation Authorities a local board, 
with boundaries set by the natural parameters of water flow. A watershed is defined as a land area that channels rainfall and snowmelt towards or to creeks, streams, rivers, and eventually out to outflow points such as reservoirs, bays, lakes, and oceans. You will note, Speaker, that nowhere in that definition are the words municipal, provincial, or any mention of property ownership. Water does not heed political boundaries or any human-created lines on a map. So the CAs were for formulated to focus on a particular, each particular watershed. They've developed significant expertise in the flow of water, and most notably surface water, across their own individual watersheds. And since the 1950s, conservation authorities across the province have continued to do that work. And as a side note, while the CAs and the progressive municipalities they partner with have been very successful in directing new development, especially residential growth, new housing that this government is so very focused on, of course there was and still are residential areas in towns and villages across the province that were built before these efforts took hold. So yes, we still have housing areas that are at risk for flooding. But I am very grateful that through the efforts of our CAs, our municipal partners and this government, all new housing developments across the province are reviewed with a focus on making sure they won't face flooding risks. We are being told by the scientific community that we are likely to see higher levels of disruptive weather, stronger storms, and more frequent and heavier rainfalls in the coming years. And the CAs continue to provide the expertise and the flood or other risk management prevention. In fact, our government has moved to increase the focus of the CAs on exactly these issues. If I may jump to a slightly different timeline, in the 1970s, several times as a, a young Boy Scout, I took part in an annual event called Trees for Canada. Together with cubs from across my region, right, we came together to plant pine trees at the Little Cataract Lake Conservation Area. This conservation area is located in a floodplain just north of the city of Kingston. And, when, and while when it was acquired by the CA, it was mostly disused farmland, cleared of forest, it was secured because it would provide that buffer zone for floodwaters in the event of extreme storms. Numerous times over the decade, this area has filled with water, preventing downstream damages from the city of Kingston, and thus serving its purpose. The trees that have been planted there, now some 40 years later, are now a large forest and wonderful to see, and adds even more capacity to store water and manage extreme weather events. Of course, back in the 70s, I had no idea that a few decades later, I would have the privilege of serving are being elected as the chair of that same Cataract Way Region Conservation Authority in the year 2002. I spent about eight years with the Conservation Authority as a representative of one of its member municipalities. I was also honoured to be asked to serve as a founding member of the Cataract Way Source Water Protection Committee, which is a seat that I continued with until just this last spring when I prepared to join this assembly. During my time with the CRCA, I saw the increasing focus and that the CA had on providing education to our young people. They were heavily engaged in bringing more people, especially our youth, out into the natural spaces and providing education and awareness of the importance of these spaces. This is when I learned of the value of our wetlands, both as a natural filter and cleaning system for our most precious resource, our waters, and that the wetlands also provide a tremendous addition to the protections from flooding and other natural ha hazards around human habitations. They need to be go as good at this as they are at the other elements of their mandate, namely permitting and approvals. Speaker, Ontario is in a housing crisis, and our conservation authorities are an essential tool in ensuring that new housing starts continue as immigration rates rise so that everyone can own a home. We are working with our conservation authorities to remove barriers to build more houses across Ontario, and we're also working with the public, the stakeholders, municipalities, and Indigenous communities to review provincial housing and land use pol planning policies to create more attainable housing. That's why our government is supporting conservation authorities as they focus on their core mandate, which include natural hazard risk management and flood prevention. 
And I must add that there are other organizations that are specifically mandated and have the right resources to provide additional to su support to the conservation authorities. The Invasive Species Centre are experts in just that, invasive species, and the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks have the professional and scientific staff resources to be the leaders in pollution management and addressing climate change. There are some areas of overlap, which is why MECP led the source water protection file and partnered with the CAs to take advantage of their watershed knowledge. Conservation authorities, and more accurately their staff, have the greatest expertise in that one specific area, flooding. They have hydrogeologists and engineers and the planners to work with our municipal partners to ensure that never again do we build homes in areas that are likely to flood. And they can work with our municipal partners and the people who build those homes to ensure that mitigation measures are put in place to ensure that these homes are not damaged. There is no perfect system, but with this level of expertise and a focus on these tasks, even in the face of more extreme weather events, we can implement positive plans to minimize these risks. Madam Speaker, this bill speaks to the risks that are faced within developments that happened years, in some cases decades ago, to help homeowners protect their homes that were built before this level of protection was implemented. The people, the private homeowners that face these risks, like those in Beaches East York, in my own riding of Hastings, Lennox and Addington, and in ridings across the province, I am certain, Speaker, that this information and education is important and beneficial for many people with older homes across the province. Where we have newer communities, because of the work by the government and because of the work of, of the focused conservation authorities and planners, there is little need for this bill. But there are other areas with those older homes and older subdivisions that did not benefit from the flood and risk management expertise of the CAs. So, Speaker, I need to bring to, to the attention of this House the public awareness campaigns on flooding that are managed by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. That ministry publishes real-time information on flooding conditions in Ontario and provides for actions that Ontarians can take to prepare for and mitigate the effects of flooding. The, at www.ontario.ca forward slash floods. The ministry is very active on social media, promoting other things, flooding awareness, and further helping our residents to locate publicly available resources and information around flood prevention and mitigation to be able to attain answers to their questions about flooding. So, Speaker, I have to say that MNRF is already doing most of what this bill is aiming at. We even already have a proclaimed week. Ontario recognizes the first week of May as Emergency Preparedness Week, which ties into the national events supported by Public Safety Canada and is coordinated with the provincial management organizations across the country. And this emergency preparedness includes awareness about flooding. I can also report to this House that this government, with a whole-of-government approach under the leadership of the Premier and the support of the Ministers of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, have demonstrated action in response to the impact of flooding. We've invested over $200 million in municipal stormwater and wastewater projects. We've allocated $7.6 million in, flooding, in funding for flood mapping for conservation authorities and municipalities. We've investing, we're investing $4.7 million per year in flood forecasting and warning networks that help municipalities better prepare for flood events. And we've committed over $30 million to protect wetlands, one of the biggest wetland recovery investments in provincial history. And we've also implemented Ontario's first ever provincial climate impact assessment. Finally, Speaker, I would like to once again thank the sponsor, uh, the member from Beaches East York, for bringing forward this bill and providing the opportunity to speak about and have the audience learn about the issues around flooding awareness than all that our government has already done in this manner. But as you can see, Speaker, the bill itself is actually not needed because the topics are already covered. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further debate? I recognize the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I'd like to begin by thanking the member from Beaches East York for bringing forward this very important bill. Um, I agree with you 
and all the points that you made about why this is an important bill, particularly when it comes to people's personal property and protecting the residents of Ontario. It's our job here uh, to protect uh, the residents of Ontario, their, their, their health and, and their, their property as well. And so, yes, homeowners absolutely need protection. We need to address this bill. It's an important bill that helps raise the awareness of why this is such a significant problem for uh, Ontarians. I would just like to say, though, uh, that I just would like to say I have, you know, if you will take this in the spirit in which it's delivered, I have some like upstream solutions that you could have maybe put into this bill that I think would would <laughs> I know so I knew you'd like that, John. But really, uh, you know, I, I appreciate uh, the, the, that you want people to be informed. You know, we could have required real estate sellers to make sure people are informed when they're purchasing homes, when they're looking at homes. That would be some good protection for potential homeowners. Um, you know, I, I know that we're talking about a lot of the role the municipalities have, but we need to make sure that municipalities continue to have the resources, the revenues that they need to do this work. As we know, municipalities are struggling with the damage that climate change and flooding has, uh, has uh, enacted on their infrastructure, their roads, their sewers. And so municipalities play a key role in this, but they're struggling to keep up. And as we know, with Bill 23, uh, we're going to see a, a, res a huge result in, the, in the, the revenues of the municipalities go down, potentially raising property taxes. Um, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario estimated at about a billion dollars of lost revenue for municipalities. So they're going to be struggling just to maintain their own infrastructure and also their ability to protect people from flooding. And so, uh, you know, they, they can provide the information. It's important that residents know, but we, we need to be doing a bit more. You know, you mentioned flood, uh, the Auditor General's report, and I think that's really important that we also acknowledge that we are doing a terrible job in the province of Ontario in flood mapping. And flood mapping is critical for insurance companies, it's, flood, it's important for potential developers, it's important for people that are buying property. And the Auditor General said, which is distressing to hear, that Ontario does not have a coordinated plan to deal with the increasingly intense flooding and its impact on urban areas. And that's what we're talking about here. So she went on to say, what we're seeing in the environmental arena are expectations that the money isn't there to achieve and meet. And so we know what we need to do in the province of Ontario, but b given the government's uh, underfunding of these ministries, the, their, their uh, moves that are taking uh, money away from the coffers of the municipalities, we're, we're not able to, to have the good information that we need uh, to make sure that people are um, safe and that they know how to where to build and where not to build and where to buy and where not to buy. Conservation Authority. So I, I hear there's a number of folks here from the Conservation Authorities, and welcome to the legislature, but I am here to brag about Hamilton's Conservation Authority, if that's okay with you. <laughs> and so we have done in Hamilton some um, remarkable and innovative work on flood protection. So you may or may not have heard of um, the work that we have done in, in the area called Salt Fleet Marsh. Well, Salt Fleet Marsh, in that area, the conservation authorities are building, a, they've got this wetland conservation program. And if you're not familiar with the geography of, well, Hamilton, actually it's Ontario, so Niagara Falls falls over the escarpment. That's, that's the Niagara escarpment. Hamilton, when we talk about the mountain in Hamilton, remember from Hamilton Mountain? The mountain is the escarpment and I'm from Hamilton West Ancaster Dundas, and I'm below the escarpment. And Stony Creek, uh, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, um, that's an area that's significantly impacted by flooding. And literally, it floods on top of the mountain, the escarpment, and it flows down. And we've had significant problems with flooding in the lower area of the city, Stony Creek. People were basically flooded out, their basins are flooded out, businesses were flooded out. So the Conservation Authority undertook to create these areas, to acquire land, uh, and to create these naturalized wetlands that will, will retain uh, water to prevent flooding. So they're creating four new uh, wetlands, um, and that says once they're completed, they will have the ability to hold the equivalent of, equivalent of 236 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So that is a significant contribution and an innovative way uh, to help reduce uh, downstream flooding and protect homes and property. It remains to be seen with the changes that this government has made to conservation authorities where they, where, whether or not they will be able to continue on with this innovative uh, work that they're doing. Because as we know, um, you know the, the, the government has Actually, I have an article here I have no time to read, but the title is, While You're on Holiday, 
Ontario strip conservation authority powers. So we know that this government has been on a path to, to strip away the powers from conservation authorities who do this kind of innovative work to protect, uh, to protect people from flooding. We also know, you know, that this government has opened up the green belt despite uh, promises not to. Building on the green belt and flooding kind of go hand in hand. I mean, when you build, when you intersect streams, when you build on floodplains, you're only asking for, for trouble. And in Hamilton, we know that and we knew that. I want to give out a shout out to the Stop Sprawl folks in Hamilton that said, when we build out into these areas, we lose farmland, it costs us a lot of money, and we risk flooding. You know, we're paving over wetlands. It makes no sense to anybody, maybe perhaps this government. We had folks uh, that in Hamilton, the, the uh, Save Our Stream folks, that were working to protect the headwaters of the Ancaster Creek, which flows down into Coots Paradise. It's been, has, has some significant trouble. Um, I would just say that those folks deserve a shout out because they're working uh, to understand the impact of all of the streams and how they intersect. So I want to take this time again to thank the member for this bill. It's an important step. It's an important first step and the many steps that we need to take to protect Ontarians from the impact of flooding. Thank you, Speaker. Further debate, I recognize the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. I find the ballot date of Bill 56 to be very timely. The debate also nicely coincides with the idea that the fourth week of March be Flooding Awareness Week. Springtime, when the weather warms, we are preoccupied with getting our yards and our flower beds in shape, but many of us fail to turn our attention to preparing our properties for the spring thaw. And I would point out that if we're waiting until May to do that, it might be a bit late. Raising awareness for proper preparedness can prevent potential water damage, basement flooding, and often proper, the property's electrical systems. I know the member from Beaches East York has done a tremendous amount of work on this bill, and I believe she's spoken to each and every member of this legislature. And we've heard that she also has a great deal of support, support that's here tonight from some professionals and people in the insurance uh, business. So they obviously feel that more can be done, that we can do more. In my riding, large storms along the shore of Lake Erie often wreak havoc with constituents, with high water levels and wind that cause damage to homes and cottages. And this can be extremely costly. In 2019, the government, through the Municipal Disaster Recovery Assistance Program, doled out $4.5 million to help with recovery in Haldeman County. That doesn't include individual insurance claims, and I'm wondering if, if something like Bill 56 would help lower such, such payouts. Speaker, you can never have too much information. You can never have too much education. So I think an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and Bill 56 is a simple step that will go a long way to benefit residents, municipalities, and many of our financial institution, institutions. I'm very happy to stand tonight and support the member from Beaches East York and Bill 56. Thank you. Further debate, I recognize the member from Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I rise to speak in favour of Bill 56, and I want to thank the member from Beaches East York for bringing it forward. In 1954, Hurricane Hazel hit Ontario. 81 people tragically died. Thousands of people lost their lives due to flooding. The government of the day strengthened the rules for conservation authorities and brought in stronger environmental protections because they said we would never let it happen again. And it seems like we have a government that is forgetting those lessons as it weakens conservation authorities, environmental protections, and is opening sensitive lands like the Greenbelt for development at a time when the risk of flooding is on the rise. Extreme weather cost this country $3.1 billion last year alone. We know that the cost of climate-fueled weather events to our public infrastructure will be $26.2 billion just in the next seven years of this decade. The least we can do is educate Ontarians about this risk and properly warn them about them. That's what Bill 56 does. That's why I'll be voting for it. For the debate, I recognize the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I will uh, stay on track this time. And uh, I just I want to congratulate uh, the member from Beaches East York for bringing this forward. She's done a lot of work on this. And at our best, private members' bills give expression to things that are happening in our community, the efforts that people are making. And what we're hearing from the outside is, very respectfully, we need to do more. Things have changed. Extreme weather events have changed the nature of flooding. There are simple things we can do to help people, not just from financial hardship, but the hardship of having those things that are important to you be destroyed, right? People having to move out of 
basement apartments. If people can avoid flooding by doing simple things, as I understand, that could take a weekend and a couple hundred bucks to do, like cleaning the eaves, which uh, Mary Margaret would have all of us do, and uh, which we should do, which I was reminded of when we just had a little reception. So I think this is a good thing. I think it's something we can all support in here. And I really encourage all members here to think of it as something that we're going to do together that's going to give expression to an effort that's happening out there in the community to protect people from risk. Thank you, Speaker. I recognize the member for Toronto Danforth. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Beaches East York for bringing forward this bill. Uh, I think the intent is good. I think that the actual impact would be positive if the bill were adopted. Uh, but I also have to say, we're really going to need this bill. Because you know this is a government that's stepping on the gas to make the world hotter, right? Like this, world, this government is completely committed to making the world as hot as possible so that heating is not needed in January. I mean, that, that is the direction we're talking about. I want to start with the tender mercies of their climate plan. And those who read the 2018 plan, which, by the way, is still officially the plan, will know that the Auditor General looked at it and said, man, you have some big flaws here. Like, I recommend you use evidence when you draw conclusions. Uh, you know, when the Auditor General says you should make a decision based on evidence, you know you're, you're plumb and rock bottom there. But even if they were successful, even if they delivered on their plan, which they cannot, the target of a 30% reduction over 2005 is dramatically insufficient. It will not protect us. It will not set the example for the rest of the world that we need to have set. Speaker, recently the Minister of the Environment has talked about the new developments. Okay, that old plan we still hold to. We've gone beyond that. We're going to save all kinds of greenhouse gas pollution because we put in place all these transit plans. Well, I actually took a look, and almost every one that was cited by the minister isn't going to be completed until 2030, or date unknown. Those are my favorites, date unknown. So when you actually ask the ministry what are the greenhouse gas savings from those transit plans, they're minuscule. Within this decade, we need to dramatically cut our emissions, or the member's motion is inadequate and every house needs a lifeboat. No offense, you did your best. Your imagination didn't go far enough to the craziness that's before us. So, um, the minister was talking about we're going to invest in steel plants, which we should, which we should. We have to have the conversion. We should invest in electric vehicles, which we should. We have to do that. But you look at the independent electricity system operator, which has some credibility with this government, and they did a graph showing the emissions increase from more gas plants and the emissions decrease from steel and cars. Well, what do you know? There's no reduction because the emissions are going up from the gas plants. They're wiping out any greenhouse gas emission savings from the other measures. So, man, do we need this bill and a lifeboat in every house. The member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington. I'm amazed that, that you're allowed out on the streets with this plan that you got. But I, I will go on. The member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington talked about the conservation authorities. Speaker, Government there's a dog House barking Leader. in the house. Can Government you do something about that? As Shakespeare said, let no dog bark. Anyway. Talking about conservation authorities, the government, government is taking a meat axe to conservation water. authorities and their ability to protect us from flooding, and everybody in this room knows that. And you look at the Ontario wetland evaluation system and the meat grinder it was put through, you've got conservation authority after conservation authority, regional municipality after regional municipality, talking about how those changes are going to eliminate wetlands and increase flooding. We've got the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, the Regional Council of Halton, Hamilton Conservation Authority, Grand River Conservation Authority, all talking about the impact on wetlands of what this government is doing. So not only does it want to make the world a lot hotter, 
It makes want to make Southern Ontario an awful lot wetter. An awful lot wetter. Your bill, ambitious, decent, still. The scale of risk is far greater than what's being addressed here. I think what you brought forward was reasonable. I just want to point out how much worse this government makes, wants to make things. I want to wrap by saying the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change talked about the moment that we're at. The potential is there for the world to hit three or four degrees centigrade of warning. That is talking about a biblical future and not the good parts of the Bible, not the fun parts. I'm talking about the damnation and brimstone parts. At the same time, the potential is there. We have the technology, we have the smarts, we have the knowledge to actually rescue ourselves, rescue future generations. And that's what we need to do. This bill should be adopted. This bill should be implemented. But we need to go beyond it. We need to make sure that we can actually cut our emissions so that the scale of flooding that we're dealing with is not you know, a thousand year or 10,000 year storm every, every fall. We're talking about trying to stabilize the climate so we have a future. Thank you, member. I recognize the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague from Beaches East York for this bill, Bill 56. It's a simple bill. Uh, the government should say yes. Um, when we talk about a climate emergency, the government doesn't want to talk about that. In your budget that you presented, you've only mentioned climate emergency, climate change once in, in that budget. And, um, and, and not talking about it doesn't mean that the incidences are not happening. Um, the fact is that Ontarians are at risk. It's not just happening here in Toronto in my own riding of Scarborough Guildwood. It's happening all over the province. Um, so I would encourage you to say yes to this bill. I want to thank my friend Blair Feltmate from Intact Centre for joining us. <laughs> Further debate, I recognize the government house leader. I think the speech from the member for Toronto, Danforth, highlights why the NDP lost uh, uh, lost 10 seats, lost 833,000 votes, and have never served. We are out of time for debate. <laughs> Ms. McMahon, uh, the government house leader and the member for Toronto Danforth, the government house leader and the member for Toronto Danforth will come to order. The time provided for private members. Oh, actually, no. I go back to the member for two-minute reply. My apologies. Back to the member for Beaches East York for a two-minute reply. And it just shows you tonight how we can't get anything done for Ontarians. Are you kidding me? It's a piece of paper with education that will help your residents be safe. It is nothing more. It's not difficult for you. What's the harm? Saving them $43,000, protecting them. You are just telling Ontarians you don't care. You don't want to work together. I spoke to the ministers. I had a meeting in Minister Pacini's office, the Minister of Environment's office, who said he'd support this. What you, the city of Oakville, is being sued right now by residents because of their basements flooding. May I remind the member? to please make her comments through the chair. With respect to my colleague, my government colleague, this, who says this is not needed, you tell that to everyone who lives in an old home. Not everyone lives in Once again, I would remind the member to address the chair. Basically, no one knows about your Environmental Emergency Protection Week. No Once again, I'd like to remind the member to make her comments through the chair. Madam Speaker, no one knows about the Emergency Prepared Week. No one knows about your flooding. It doesn't go far enough, your education. What is the harm in sending this paper out? It is a valid infographic done by experts that can save your residents anguish, money, and grief. Why don't you take my bill? You take it. You run with I have to ask the member to address the chair, please. Comments through the chair. Sure. Why doesn't the government take carriage of my bill? I don't need my name on it. I'm not a shameless egomaniac. I just want to get things done for the greater good and help Ontarians be safe. It's easy enough to do that. You have the chance to do it tonight. We are all not doing enough. 
Please take my bill and run with it. The time provided for private members, public business has expired.